Вася, ты потом In July 19, Ukraine Media Center Ukraine Forum continues its operation. My name is Vasil Samakvalov, and we're starting our event. We will be talking about the implementation of the anti-corruption policy in defense sector during the war. We will have a couple of panels, and during the first panel, we have three very prominent, or I would say, influential speakers who can answer this intriguing question for us. So joining us are Alexander Novikov, head of the National Agency on Corruption Prevention, Alexei Reznikov, Defense Minister of Ukraine, and Alexander Commission, Minister for Strategic Industries of Ukraine. So let's start with Mr. Alexander Novikov, and he will answer us the question how to overcome the corruption. Thank you, dear colleagues, for joining this event. You know, and our anti-corruption policy became one of the co-founders of this event because the corruption in Russia is our in Russia is our friend, and in Ukraine it's our enemy. So overcoming the corruption, we will win the soonest possible. And the NACP proceeded from overcoming corruption to building of NATO standards. We're moving towards transparency and faithfulness. We stand for faithfulness as an ethic category and a category which defines the efficiency of any institution. But according to the decree of the president, Yaroslav Lubchenko, my deputy, was appointed responsible for NATO building program in Ukraine, which means that the role of National Agency on Corruption Prevention increased in coordination with the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Strategic Industries of Ukraine as a facilitator for building faithfulness in Ukraine. Moreover, we deployed a unit in NACP to build faithfulness in the in the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. It's headed by Marina Barinina, present here too. She has to ensure she has to ensure the integrity policy in compliance system in Ministry of Defense for implementation of the state program. Talking about the medicines, we prepared it the last year and the parliament approved the anti-corruption strategy, the medicines against corruption. It was the state program implemented by the government on the 4th of March this year. There is the plan for administration of those medicines. 35 measures will be introduced today by NACP. So please get involved in their implementation. So I want to emphasize the loyalty in the processes of management by the Minister of Defense, Alexei Reznikov, and Mr. Alexander Commission, the Minister of Strategic Industries of Ukraine. Moreover, upon the initiative of Mr. Commission, we, in coordination with the new head of Ukraboron Prom, identified the joint actions on implementation of integrity policy in Ukraboron Prom. And integrity means the efficiency of the main defense company of Ukraine. So I'm open to the question to the questions after the after my speech, so I want to give floor to Mr. Alexei. Yeah, we have an extensive platform here, defense and strategic industries and everything. Well, yeah, I have a couple of notes here. I will be ready for answering all the questions, but again, I want to reflect the speech of Mr. Alexander about the medicines administration as the head of parliamentary committee who helped to implement that program before it was considered by the government. There were battles, we were looking for compromises and solutions, uh, but we we finally made it. Mr. Alexander says about the medicines, but I would rather be talking about the protocols for treating diseases. It's not only about the medicines, because there is a number of stories that should be implemented by every state institution to 
to achieve a healthy organism because in fact those are the metastases that prevents um, us from being a healthy country. Now that we're repelling the Russian enemy, this fight with our adversary from the point of view of military potential, everything that weakens us from the point of view of military potential are the serious challenges for us as a nation, as a country. So today we also depend not only on our own resources, I mean the bombardments, the loss of jobs, the attempts of blackouts taken by the enemy, so we cannot use our own resource to repel the enemy 100%. We are being supported by our partners and to make sure that our partners on the high level continue doing what they're doing, I want to remind you that in November 2021, right upon my appointment, I was asking for stingers during my first visit in the United States and they said it was impossible, but you know, in January it became possible. We got the first shipment of stingers and you know, first 155 artillery was impossible, then Heimers, then tanks, then APCs, Patriots, everything was impossible, just like F-16s. Now it all became, it all has become possible. It means that the level of trust to the state, to the government officials increased the level of trust in our armed forces, in their efficiency increased as well. So now we need that trust as well, just like the efficiency and the efficiency of use of this aid that we're getting in humanitarian area, in financial area, everything helps us a lot. And the corruption is a rust that undermines, that destroys that trust and prevents us using our defense potential in full. So zero tolerance to corruption is not only a slogan, it's an important element of our survival. And in, in future as well, not only now, because Russians are not going anywhere, even given their friendship with Elon Musk, they're not going to space, they will remain our neighbors, they will dream of revenge, and we should create a country so capable, so capable to defend themselves that not only, that they should not only even consider that revenge for them. So the philosophy of zero tolerance to corruption is being confessed by our ministry and there are three main directions we were moving in 2023. First is the structural changes to prevent the corruption risk by distribution of authorities. And one of the examples is the continuation of procurement reform because procurement is one of the components which is a point of vulnerability for any country whether they are a part of NATO, modernized and up to date but it's still a task and a problem. So today we are on the way of transferring functions of procurement from departments of Department of Defense because they should be involved in coordination with the armed forces of Ukraine and all those functions should be transferred to the relevant agencies. Now we have agency dealing with the defense procurement and on the stage of its launch is the agency that will deal with the logistic support so we could work under the new rules. We have the political will for that and today we're just working on the regulations. Another direction is the digital transformation starting with the logistics programs such as LogFest from NATO or Carvai and so on and so forth. Soon we are about to launch SAP so it enables us to lift it to the level of maximum transparency, control and responsibility and respectively to minimize any corruption component, including the digital accounting of the servicemen. The, the, there is dissatisfaction in the society, there, is, uh, there are scandals with, which are related to the representatives of the subscription center, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, because they are the dirt that contaminates the clean water. So we're working with NACP in this area. We have joint goals 
and joint, undertake joint efforts. And the third direction is the reinforcement of anti-corruption discipline. We have a department which improved its work and the work of its territorial units, so we support creation of the department in NACP for integrity policy formation in the security and defense sector. So Mr. Sergei is symbolically sitting right by the side of the colleague, Sergei Stepanyan, who is the head of our department. So I'm sure that we're working together towards the victory. Also, I want to mention that we need to get those right signals about the integrity because sometimes the regulation in effect doesn't oblige us to do some things, but we can start doing them because they are in, not in violation of the law, but rather it's a signal to the society, like, do what I do. I'm not, uh, I'm not concerned about that, I'm just giving you facts. I'm one of the members of the government who submitted the declaration the tax declaration, however, I'm exempt from that obligation during the martial law. And I'm planning to do that for year 2022. I'm finalizing my paperwork now, so to, given all the nuances of the martial law, but I do it on a voluntary basis. I'm not obliged to do so. On top of that, it's not contemplated by any law, the creation of anti-corruption council at the Ministry of Defense, but we have created it. It works for three months already. We will have the first meeting, the, f the summary for the first three months, but I see the positive movements is the advisory body that does their job. They do it on a high level, high quality, and Respectively, I want to pay your attention today that, again, the legislation in effect does not oblige the Ministry of Defense to procure anything for the armed forces of Ukraine at, at Prozoro platform on, because it's contemplated by the martial laws. But we've analyzed the legislation and we've seen that what exists, the logistics, the uniform, the meals, we can do it even during the martial law, we can get to the transparent platforms, competitive platforms, and we've returned to Prozoro platform, and thanks to that system, we've fulfilled another procurement of the medicine service for the huge number of our armed forces servicemen, so I think it's a positive movement, and we will go through all the rest of the procurements which do not contemplate a secrecy regime. So today, for us, after the successful NATO summit in Vilnius, the integration to NATO, in fact, is the task of the Ministry of Defense at minute, minimum and at maximum of the whole country. And the euro, when the political decision will be taken, it's not about the weapons, but also about the standards and procedures. NATO is not only a military union, but a political military union. This is why the ministers of defense and ministers of foreign affairs are represented there. So it's an alliance of two ministries of every country, every member country, because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is responsible for political coordination and the Ministry of Defense for, is responsible for coordination on a defense level. So. NATO standards are important for us. Transparency, accountability, and prevention of corruption risk. This is what we need, not they need it. We need it for the future force concept, something that we need to build and develop today. For example, there is NSPA in NATO, NATO Support Procurement Agency that we cooperate directly with. Our employees go to get trainings there so that our agencies, which will be analogous to their NSPA, work according to their models, according to their standards, and become a part of their network. And as a precedent, we entered into agreement with the headquarters of NATO. After Vilnius Summit, there will be a procurement review program implemented within nine or ten months for us, which will be developed by NATO specialist, the analysis, procurement, and improvement, modernization of our system. It will be not dealing with the logistics only, but with the armament and material too. 
So now we'll look at this angle, at this state anti-corruption program. It's one of the tracks that will lead us to positive voting, which will result in Ukraine becoming the 33rd member of the alliance and the next year will be the 33rd year of the independence of Ukraine. It would be quite symbolic. Our task is to do it. For me, as a minister, as a lawyer, implementation of this program is the organic step and necessary step. So we started implementing it in the Ministry of Defense. I'm reporting it to you. On the 1st of April, I approved the implementation of its measures. Today is disposal of the property lands and the intellectual property procurement of uh, goods and services for defense and security purposes, implementation of the military personnel policy. We need to achieve 16 strategic results and implement 61 strategic measures since we perceive this building of integrity as uh, stimulus to action i'm sure we will do it we know that there are bottlenecks i want to mention them too which we will probably need to discuss today with the colleagues from nacp and other government institutions something probably will need to be postponed when the program was written it had a timeline but the implementation was postponed maybe it's an objective process but the stack of the program was not updated and the term got shorter and some things cannot be fulfilled just physically those are technical things we keep working on them they are not tactical or even strategic things but we will just ask to postpone some fulfillment terms it doesn't mean that we stop or we refuse to do it we will only ask to postpone them and we will have to do it just with quality. There is a mechanism for provision of bulletin for the servicemen. We want to have this procedure more facilitated for the military and the members of their families. We need to update the legislation which will standardize the idea laid as fundamental to the program. So some things should be postponed after the victory. There will be a victory. So again, I want to get back to declaration. I have nothing to hide, nothing to conceal. Everything that I made, I was feeling the declaration see that it's undesirable to be seen by the enemy. I think that this restriction regarding the servicemen is reasonable, it's clever. We sh should win first and then get back to the total declarations so that we should maintain the balance between accountability and transparency and security those are difficult things but they are realistic in my opinion so for the time being the program contemplates the automatized control with the help of GPS trackers of the transport that transports fuel it's a normal story for the peacetime but now we understand that the enemy may gain access to those trackers and they may damage the fuel trucks, so we cannot do it now. I hope we are heard. It's quite reasonable. Those are reasonable remarks. There is, There should be no discussion around it. Again, as they say in the publics, the, the, as the young men say, we respect it. Fierce plus together to the victory. I'll make a small comment. When the parliament was approving in the June last year the anti-corruption strategy, they allowed the Ministry of Defense to start its fulfillment after the victory. And the personal position of the Minister of Defense was not to wait for the victory and start working on building integrity in security and defense sector today, which means that we will build this integrity in the Ministry of Defense and the same position is with the Ministry of the Strategic Industries of Ukraine. I'm proposing to give the floor to Mr. Alexander. I know that he's got some presentation with him, so let's proceed from the Army to Defense and Security Sector. I will tell you how we will build the anti-corruption infrastructure in the defense sector. 
So our main two goals is to build the efficient anti-corruption infrastructure in defense and security sector and to monitor and control what's going on in the defense and security sector. I mean in government controlled companies. There was a long preparation to, of transformation of state concern in to the joint stock company and now the state concern is transformed into a joint stock company the supervisory board is being composed now we work on both internal structure and organization i mean the supervisory council in compliance with with all the oecd principles compliance and risk management as well as an external infrastructure i mean the National Anti-Corruption Agency and Watchdogs Public, which will help us to become more transparent and efficient. We work on making defense procurement more efficient, more transparent. We work on preservation of the, on the security balance and we try to to develop the program of efficient disposal of government property. We're looking for a mechanism how to dispose of them in an efficient manner, transferring them to the National Property Fund and to continue developing. Well, that's it. And we're ready to proceed to Q&A session. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. We have foreign journalists here, just in case we have simultaneous translation going on in case you need a headphone so we can proceed to Mr. Alexander, the Minister of Defense was saying about some dirt that sometimes contaminates our clean water. So the military commissioners, is can our anti-corruption agents deal with them? Now, now, upon the decree of the program initiated by the Ministry of Defense within this quarter, we intend to monitor the way of life of 100% of all the officials of the conscription centers. And now we already have some results. Just today, there will be an opinion forwarded to the agency about the illegal enrichment of Odessa Regional Conscription Center. We were discussing it with Minister of Defense. It's in fact the record opinion of the identification of the facts of illegal enrichment. 188 million. The previous one was regarding the brother of the Re Regional Administrative Court of Kiev. One single property bought in Spain and assigned to the mother of that person costs 3,700,000 euro. It's 15th of December last year when Ukraine was under everyday shelling by the enemy, everyday missile strikes. And there is a number of such properties costing, which and their cost starts from 500,000 euro. And that person said that they were borrowing money. The total amount of borrowings is four million one hundred thousand dollars. The money was lent by a number of uh, businessmen, and one of them is the owner of a Ibiza club in Odessa. He borrowed, he lent money to the to this head of the conscription center, which fact is not reflected in the tax declaration. This is what Minister, Mr. Minister said when a person declares their proceeds uh, in a transparent manner, they can lend such amount of funds to somebody. But again, some agreements were signed in Odessa by a number of citizens who were absent in the city of Odessa at that moment of signing and uh, in activity of this Odessa unit we identified the facts not only of illegal enrichment but also of the channels of illegal immigration abroad all those materials will be forwarded to the law enforcement agencies i hope this state investigation bureau 
which investigates the facts against such persons, they will forward this case to the court and all those villas in Spain, the, the costly vehicles, they will be confiscated upon the award of the court. So yes, the case is currently in the State Bureau of Investigation. Your questions, please. Uh, good morning, Minister uh, Lorenzo Cremonesi for the Italian Daily Corriere della Sera. As you know, in Italy, the question of corruption is a big question <laughs> nationally. Uh, Minister, uh, two short questions. Uh, first one, uh, after the new summit, NATO summit uh, last week, uh, do you feel that the corruption question was still very much on the agenda? was a request, uh, you felt it was still important. And secondly, you mentioned the symbolic date of 33 next year. What makes you think that for, to, for next, next year this can happen? I mean, you can enter in NATO. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Are you hearing the translation? Well, it's my pleasure to tell you that I was personally attending Vilnius. I was a part of the delegation head by Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. And two days that we were staying there, the communication was on the bilateral meetings with presidents and prime ministers of the countries. And all the sessions that we've attended, the word corruption never sounded as a requirement to Ukraine. It means that our institutional efforts, the efforts of the parliament, of the newly established anti-corruption bodies, those that uh, were launched, well, well, for example, NACP exists for a long time, and the new appointment of the new management in Naboo, and the anti-corruption court, I mean, and so on and so forth. This is something that was properly evaluated by the partners. This is why the level of trust has grown, and. It, in the summit, there were, there were talks about the reforms of Ukraine, but again, within those days, I haven't heard the word corruption a single time, which means we're moving in the right direction, along the right trend. As to another summit in Washington, yeah, you were asking about the next summit in Washington, correct? There was your, uh, it was your second question, right? So it will be in Washington. The next summit will be happening in Washington. Yeah, you were asking about the last summit, correct? The f what you mentioned, you said next year will be our 33 year uh, an anniversary and, and you were s hoping that uh, in that occasion uh, Ukraine could be accepted as part of NATO. So my question is what you think that this can happen, what, what you make thinking? Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, it's symbolic, the figure 33, right? I've seen that symbolism in Lithuania when in the morning I was doing my morning exercises, I was able to wake up and go up the mountain where the Gideminas Tower is located. It's a symbolic place for every Lithuanian and they announced a support program for Ukraine in Lithuania. 33,000 yellow and blue banners or balloons all across Lithuania and from that Tower of Gideminis, I was able to see the whole Lithuania with the 33,000 Ukrainian flags. This is the symbolism of the figure that Ukraine should become a 33rd member of NATO. Let's not forget that the next year it, the NATO will mark its 75th anniversary. The alliance was created to repel the aggression of Soviet Union or Russian Empire, whatever we call them, and the main purpose of creation of NATO is to counter Russian Empire. Now there is only one country in the world that has real practical experience of military counteraction to the so-called second army of the world, and this country is Ukraine. I think that there should be no more arguments necessary to invite Ukraine to NATO. Our capability, our interoperability with the countries of NATO says that they should be interested to have Ukraine as a NATO member. So I think that it's a symbolic on the 75th anniversary in Washington because the Washington Agreement was laid as fundamental to establishment of the alliance, but still we have to overcome, we, we have to make some little homework. 
well, I'm joking about a small homework, so it's a big task, but we have to win. I have to say that Mr. Alexander Commission is about to leave in 10 minutes, so I want to ask all the speakers to ask their questions from them. Good afternoon, Kyiv Post, Marina Shashko. Mr. Alexander, question to you. There was information that Russia has a mass manufacturing of drones. So can you please tell us what is the situation on our part? What is the number of drones manufactured by us on a monthly basis? Do we have all the necessary parts? And what is the story with the drone that was announced by Ukrabaran Prom with an effective distance of 1,000 kilometers? Is it already used in the front lines? I will not answer this question, I'm sorry. Well, any more questions to Mr. Alexander? Well, I hope you understand why I'm not answering your question. Well, if you don't, well, I will be ready to tell it to the journalist during off-record session, but I hope you understand that the matter of security doesn't let me to disclose all the details. But it's a very interesting story. Well, if there are no more questions to Mr. Alexander, let's proceed to other speakers. Good morning, Mr. Minister. We were in conflict with the ministry about the decree number 335 and the number of sources so that that resolution was, was either revoked or can rescinded, but we have no official confirmation of that. So do you know what is the destiny of the of this resolution 335? There was an official investigation and the Ministry of Defense went to the court about that matter. Can you give us a couple of comments on that? Well, a small lecture then. Look, in reality there was a number of regulations regulating the relations of defense and security sectors with the suppliers. During peace time, the resolution 363 regulates all those things, but for the martial law, we've adopted another resolution to untie our hands to efficiently fulfill at us in the defense sectors is the resolution 335. There, there was a revolution. Previously, there were so-called RKMs and the military representatives, they had their hands tied and they exhausted the supplier with their requirements and it was a source of corruption risks as well because it included the human factor. They could look at the RKM on the different angles and we were forcing the suppliers to take some steps so, uh, and we've cancelled those RKM procedures but this this regulation 335 it simplified some things but it was working it was in effect with the 363 so last year I invited the state audit to audit the procurement system to identify the weak links because everything was going on during the war when the majority of people were in Ushgorod or Ternopil region and the minimum number of people was working in Kiev who were capable of working but again the Ministry of Defense was going to supply the armed forces with everything necessary so the state audit Again, it's a matter of interpretation. There is no such thing written down there that the calculation cannot include the proceeds of the business that provides you with some goods or services. They thought that during the martial law it's prohibited. That's an absurd interpretation and we've submitted a remarks to this audit opinion. However, we had to resort to the with disputing of that opinion, but that approach provoked the following things. The law enforcement agencies seen that there was a damage to the government and loss inflicted on the government by the businesses and uh, resulting from improper disposition of the state-owned funds and there is a violation by the Ministry of Defense plus a violation by the supplier company, then there were criminal cases initiated, there were 
there were visits by the prosecutor's office representatives and the funds were about to be revoked this is why we propose the amendments to the resolution 1275 it's a basic regulation that regulates all those procedures so we've taken the best things from resolutions 335 and 363 and we submitted them for the consideration of the government the position of some members of the government would overtook and they thought that the businesses cannot get any proceeds during the martial law and they say let's count it starting from july which means that they made some gave some slack to the businesses starting from july but again all the results from the previous invasion they remain and there was another attempt of modernization of this regulation i was not able to be present at this meeting of the government because i had to attend rammstein 14 my deputy was attending that meeting there was a meeting with the prime minister we reached agreement with the ministry of economy ministry of finance and the ministry of economy had to amend that resolution so again i did not attend yesterday so we would be able to see the final text after the final wording after it will be put together i cannot tell you that everything is fine before i see the finalized wording but i think that there are still risks because the ukrainian businesses are deprived of the same rights as the foreign suppliers have what we need the license the quality the goods starting from cannon to the personal body armor and when we ask the ukrainian manufacturer we start torturing them and we force them not to make any proceeds not to create jobs not to pay salaries to their employees don't pay tax to the state budget let's not develop the defense capacity of our country it's nonsense so i have to publicly state that we will fight for the interests of ukrainian business because is the interest of defense capability of our country well i understand that we have to let mr alexander go yeah i want to add a couple of words we're not going to change the country we're not going to change the tolerance to corruption if we don't pronounce the existing problems the corruption practices exist where it's more where it's better and more convenient to use non-official channels of satisfaction of the needs of the citizens and the government. This situation with the government procurement, when really the Ukrainian suppliers are put in an equal position compared to the foreign suppliers, is the situation that will result in corruption and it will create corruption risks. That one of the principles of anti-corruption strategy voted by the parliament and supported by European Union, by NATO, our American partners, is that we have to say honestly where the regulation, the regulation creates corruption and we have to amend that regulation. And what Mr. Minister mentioned is the pathway of the government. The government should take those steps to mitigate the conditions for creating corruption. The representatives of some suppliers and manufacturers are present in this studio and they experience this situation on themselves when they are forced to to cover the needs of the Ukrainian army with the loss for themselves. Just a small example, Mr. Alexa Mr. Alexander, he makes miracles in developing our defense and security sector. Well, you've asked about a rocket that is supposed to fly 1,000 kilometers. What should the Ukrainian state concern do without the proceeds, without income? How can they do the research and development? How could they procure the parts and components? It's absurd. Uh, let's let Mr. Alexander go. We, he has a couple of comments. Yeah, we continue working on manufacturing more. It's good that we've seen that we have private manufacturers in Ukraine, that we have government-controlled manufacturers in Ukraine. I appreciate the support. I appreciate that our defense companies are allowed to work with income. It will allow us to intensify the growth of our in 
defense sector our foreign partners supported us they provided a necessary number of everything for us thanks to the president minister of defense everybody who got involved in the work with the partners they provided us with the necessary number of weapons of ammunition we were able to stand aground but without the launch of our defense industry we will not be able to make it so let's focus on creation of our defense sector the resolution taken by the cabinet of ministers yesterday it will allow our defense and security companies to grow faster i agree with everybody that the problem exists we have to recognize it in defense sector historically corruption was a big problem and for me in my age the management of ukrobaron prom and judging by the lexicon used by mr Alexei, we don't want to have anything in common with those problems believe me in this defense and security sector there will be procedures that will clean the sector we we are ready to see the problems and we are ready to fight them the recognition of the problems is the first step we are ready for that but without that sector clean we will feel it very difficult to continue to carry on and we will rely on watchdogs support we will rely on the support of nacp so let's work thank you thank you very much let's let mr alexander go and we will have 10 more minutes to ask questions from the two speakers who remain we have question online a question to mr novikov olena trebushna what will nacp do should the parliament approve the law on resumption on declaration of tests and will will they leave nacp without their jobs well, we haven't seen the finalized edition by the Ministry of Justice, but the one that we were responding to last week, in fact, will ruin any responsibility for non-declaration of property, for facts of any property concealed, and it will allow such persons as the one we were mentioning today to abuse their authorities without any control i hope that this week we will receive the finalized draft law by the ministry of justice that will ensure the situation when the best declaration system as it was recognized by the world bank that will ensure the integrity of ukraine in general and defense and security sector specifically the servicemen as mr minister said are not obliged to submit their declarations or the people who are currently staying in the ter temporarily occupied territories or the areas along the front lines are not obliged to submit such declarations it's in the best interest of ukrainian citizens and their interests should be taken into account in all the draft projects well let's let's take questions from the floor we'll take three or four more good afternoon my name is katrina i'm the representative of arms and weapons manufacturers association i am happy that this deregulation have happened and the local and foreign manufacturers will be in equal conditions are there any plans to provide any advantages for the local manufacturers or what should the manufacturers be prepared after those amendments that were adopted yesterday well during the meeting we were discussing at least the pilot project for the resolution which regulated manufacturing of drones there was a 25 percent income contemplated which was satisfactory for ukrainian manufacturers and we were discussing it during the meeting that that wording will be like that but again i haven't seen what was what language was voted what wording was voted uh, before it's effective but we don't stop at that we will continue beating that rock we're allies here let's take israel as an example they have a fantastic development of their defense and security sector they're being respected for them and they're being helped more for that 
and they are becoming more independent thanks to that we have no other choice than being independent we have to manufacture our weapons our helmets our personal body armor everything ours we have no other way Good afternoon, Marina Shinkarenko, Ukraine Forum. A question to Mr. Novikov. Recently there was information that NACP submitted some remarks about the draft law about the resumption of declarations. So can you tell us about those remarks? Well, war is not time for everybody to help the armed forces and to work for the victory. During the war, We've identified multiple facts of illegal enrichment by some persons, including using the procedures of procurement, corruption, using the documents that allow immigration abroad. And I want to thank Mr. Minister of Defense the government committee mitigated the risks for crossing the border however the government refused to approve it so there is a corruption at this point of border crossing and the biggest number of illegal enrichment cases was detected using the practices of illegal crossing the border so in fulfillment of the memorandum with IMF in July, the declaration, the tax declarations will be resumed, the obligation to submit such declarations. And two standards that are contemplated that w might ruin the declaration process are the standard that allows not to uh, indicate the address of residence of the declarant and the standard that allows to resubmit amended declaration and such persons would be exempt from liability in front of the society so we have two more questions and we will have to thank you because we will need to continue our work Nikita Galka, Good afternoon, Mr. Minister. It's not about corruption, but adjacent topic. Lately, the Ukrainians are talking a lot about the UAVs, and we talk about the manufacturing of Ukrainian UAVs. There is certain problem existing you may know about, and the majority of the Ukrainian UAVs is manufactured using the foreign supplied components and the manufacturers say that those components are being additionally taxed as they cross the border. So my question first is, what is your attitude to this? What is your opinion on that? And are there any negotiations with the parliament, with the ministry, to remove that taxation standard, which increases the cost of every single UAV, which increases the cost of defense of our country. It would be a good question to Mr. Commission, by the way. Well, I will answer this question. First of all, back in September, November, upon the initiative of the team of the Ministry of Defense, we've adopted the resolution that facilitated the commissioning of everything that is related to Ukrainian drones so that for example you design a new drone you would need two years to go through all the circles of hell this time if you guarantee the quality so it takes like two to three weeks if the military said that yeah it flies it bombs it shoots then here you go three weeks Another breakthrough was in coordination with Mikhail Fedorov, my colleague from the government. The resolution that uh, contemplated 25% income for the manufacturers and the third resolution would exempt the components from all the duties and taxes as they cross the border. So it's a, again, here it's a formalism, the human factor, and it's the same situation as with the audit, the resolution 335. It does not contemplate the absence of income for the manufacturer, but they thought it's so. So please 
call our hotline or call to the Ministry of Finance because they oversee, they supervise the customs. But anyway, I have to take a look at that at that order, that resolution, because we can do the startups, we can do the booming. We've gathered 82 Ukrainian manufacturers and we've commissioned 20 new drones in the armed forces that successfully destroy orcs and their material. So now, in fact, we're saying that the components are tax exempt. The comp yes, yes, but again, there are gaps. Maybe something is not perceived by the customs as a drone component. So without the specific case, I cannot give you specific details. Well, what they say about, for example, there is a remote controller for the for the drone. Well, with all due respect, I'm not a mechanic, I'm a lawyer. So you, you, you know, this button on the remote control is being taxed. Well, I, I don't know about the buttons or cables, but probably they have to hire a better customs broker. Uh, well, the last question. Reuters, Dan Belashuk, thank you for your time, thank you for your comments. I have a question to Mr. Alexei. In your speech you mentioned that anti-corruption infrastructure built in the ministry and the anti-corruption council in the ministry that it's operating for the last three months. It's uh, it's a serious period. Can you give us any example of their work? Have they managed to cover anything, any specific pro problem or any risk? Or were they able to s provide any recommendation, uh, recommendations about some risks that w would be unknown without the work of that council? What is their actual, what is the result of their work. Well, the Anti-Corruption Council delegated their representative to the collegial body that was updating the procurement services, the services for the messing in the armed forces. It's the Prozoro platform plus this collegial body that we've established. So the representative of Anti-Corruption Council were present there. They were looking through the paperwork, taking part in the discussion. But talking about the specific recommendations, I'm expecting to get some from them because Given my concept, they're working on the proposals, including the amendments to the regulations. So they went all that way. They went all that way. They've submitted about 25 requests for different documents, and the units of the Ministry of Defense of the Armed Forces provided their response and based on the information they got, I'm expecting for some specific propositions from them. I cannot say that I have a draft proposals, but I hope next week I will hear such proposals from them. I would like to add that the council was addressing NACP with a request to support them in processing of the methodology for an analysis of the candidates for the positions so we've we've made a training for this public council because we understand that every process just is as efficient as faithful is a person who is responsible for that process good people provide good results but first we have to analyze those candidates and this is where we cooperate with the minister near the Ministry of Defense. Well, on this optimistic note, we have to wrap up. We'll make a small break. I'm asking the new speakers to take their seats. It will be Svetlana Musiaka, Head of Research and Policy at the Independent Anti-Corruption Commission.
Раз. Отже, ми про So let's continue our work. Now we will continue talking about the implementation of anti-corruption policy in the defense sector during the war. Сигнали, які голос в залі, прошу притишити. Будемо говорити зараз із Глібом Канєвським, знову таки експертом з питань антикорупційної політики та Світланою Мусіякою, керівницею напрямку досліджень та вироблення політик НАКО. Знаю, що ви принесли нам презентацію, це аналітичний бриф, державна антикорупційна програма на 23-25 роки, фактори успіху для сектору оборони. Прошу вас брати мікрофон і демонструвати, показувати цю презентацію. Please take the microphone and demonstrate the presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for finding time to join us. And in continuation of what was said during the first panel, I want to focus on two things. First, we have to we have to fulfill what's contemplated by state anti-corruption policy, the priority tasks, specifically during the wartime, but we realized that the strategy of fulfillment of these or those measures should be adapted to the realities. So we've analyzed with my colleague those measures and we've checked them from the angle of to what extent is it possible and in what status they should be implemented during the war time, during the martial laws. So again, anti-corruption program, it segregated the five key problems of the defense sector. First, it's non-transparent and non-efficient disposal of different types of properties, including the real estate, intellectual property, intangible assets, the things that were mentioned by Mr. Minister, and there are certain types of property that are excessive, there are types of property that are being disposed of in non-efficient manner, and instead anti-corruption program, there is there is a focus on that, then the secrecy of the procurement that we've mentioned and the state anti-corruption program proposes certain steps to mitigate that risk. Non-efficient moment of monitoring of defense products in the process of their manufacturing, this matter is closely related to the structure of defense procurement, the quality control system that should be established and implemented in compliance with the Euro -Atlantic, European Atlantic standards, and then the non-efficient use of the budget funds and abuse during the procurement of dwellings for the servicemen and corruption risks in implementation the human resources policy in Ministry of Defense. So in every single matter we discussed their urgency, their pressing nature during our first panel. Those documents were developed before the full-scale invasion but their urgency even increased now. So we have to adapt to the current situation among those, among more than 60 steps of the anti-corruption policy in the defense sector, we've analyzed the 35 key steps and we've realized that the success of those steps depends on the number of factors, the use of the efficient system of process management. We understand that we have very limited time for implementation of those steps. We understand that there are more tasks to be fulfilled by the responsible individuals. So we understand that to use the time and resources in the most efficient manner, it should be planned properly. Yet another factor is the proactive monitoring of efficiency. And I would say that even given the conditions of the martial law, we have to preserve 
the transparency in front of the public to exercise the independent public control of the correctness and to what extent the steps are being taken. We've analyzed also our approach, we've checked the key measures and we've submitted the or we, we've put together the proposal to what extent this or that step is important for achievement of a certain strategic result and we've rated those steps by their contribution to the overall result and the biggest and the last thing is the necessity to correct the step-by-step -step plans of implementation of steps by the level of their vulnerability. What is the level of their vulnerability? We've seen that the steps that were formulated in the majority of cases contemplate the creation and development of information and analysis system or creation of a large massive of data or the maintenance of some registers, it's a big component of information security of the state. And obviously in some cases it's important to take necessary prevention steps so that the enemy cannot use that information. So according to our analysis, we've proposed to grade certain measures some of them have high level of vulnerability as i mentioned is the analysis of large masses of data promulgation of certain information so we propose to continue or to start fulfillment of those measures to start developing such systems but to commission them in full to provide the public access to such massives of data only upon our victory. The mid-level risk measures are usually the development of some regulations, audits. It's a sensitive information as well that can be restricted during the martial law but again i want to stress that we have to fulfill all of those steps but the majority of the steps in the state anti-corruption program they don't need any corrections and they can be fulfilled without any specific adaptations then i want to just demonstrate an example of those measures that were classified as the Highly, highly vulnerable the information and analytics system, the system of monitoring and accounting of the consumption and accountability for the consumption of fuel, the database of intellectual property to be created in the sector of defense, the automatized, automated system of accountability of resident, for residences of the servicemen. So those are the steps that have a high level of vulnerability in terms of access to the information. The mid-level risk are those measures that are aimed at development of some regulations. And then I want to ask you Flip to focus on some of those measures in detail. Thank you, Svetlana. Today we talk a lot about the state anti-corruption program, about the measures taken in the defense sector. Now let's look what are those measures. Well, the 65 of those that exist or those 35 that we've picked as the key steps, only the key steps that demonstrate to what extent this document and its implementation is important. It's not just the prevention of corruption. It's a it's certain way a reformation of the procedures where those measures will be implemented. So before we start talking about the measures, 
I won't give some understanding of this anti-corruption program. So NACP in all the stages of the preparation of those documents, they were engaged in the public and analytic center state watch that I'm hearing and other civil organizations, we were able to submit the proposals in all stages. We could make amendments to the program and now it's about to be adopted by the cabinet of ministers of ukraine and in our opinion it's an example of a democratic control of the implementation of anti-corruption measures in the defense sector another position is that now there will be a monitoring in place it will be exercised as it was said by the stakeholders the main stakeholders in this process, Mr. Novikov, Mr. Resnikov, Mr. Commission, they confirmed that with certain remarks the monitoring measures will be implemented in the defense sector and the public now has an ability to monitor the results of that work. So it's important for the expert communities to sort out what are those measures and when they are about to be implemented. And the last key issue is that there is a clear vision by all of the players in the government, in the parliament, in the public, in the civil society. It's not just some measures, anti-corruption measures, but it's the reformation of the country and it's a movement closer to the NATO countries. So the first measure I propose to consider that the NACP experts identified as uh, high, with a high level of vulnerability is the step in the area of procurement of fuel today it's impossible to identify the volumes procured by the of fuel procured by the ministry of defense but it's likely that the ministry today is the biggest buyer of different types of fuel and to ensure the anti-corruption policy efficiency the anti-corruption program contemplates such a step as implementation of the automated system of accountability and consumption and identification of the quality of the fuel mr Alexei mentioned about the gps trackers that it's important to track the routes of the fuel trucks which transport the fuel and one of the steps can be implemented only after the termination of the martial law. Well, the public completely agrees with the correctness of this statement, but this step also contemplates the preparation of certain regulations. It contemplates the preparation and testing of the software to launch, to launch this automatic monitoring and accountability system and in our opinion, the preparation of the paperwork and preparation of the information program, which is an extremely difficult and difficult task, is possible during the martial law, but the commission and the full commission of the system as a mandatory, so it's used by all the units, all the military bases, all other military formations, it's possible and Mr. Reznikov can corroborate it. It's possible after the victory, after our victory, after the termination of the martial law. So procurement. Procurement is quite a big area of work of the Ministry of Defense, maybe the most frequently discussed. So now we're not talking only about the procurement of fuel, but about the procurement of ammunition, material, vehicles, and weapons so active role in this step is played not only by the ministry of defense but also by the ministry of economy because we're talking about the register of government contractors here and this register operates for a long time and it's contemplated by the law on defense procurement but previously before the full-scale invasion there were problems with implementation of this register. This is why the anti-corruption program envisages that this register should exist 
should be in place because it exercises the function of decrease of the amount of co personal communications between the representatives of business where the private or government controls who manufactures the weapons and ammunition and the government authorities who procure this complex type of goods and services and anti-corruption program in our opinion is a good chance to implement this reform that was uh, contemplated by the law on, government, on defense procurement several years ago but this system we see it as one with a high risk which can unfortunately be used by the enemy during the war against us so using the example of the system for monitoring of distribution of fuel we propose to develop this platform but it should be tested first but then to commission it only after the end of the battle operations after the termination of the martial law and only then this system or at least parts of them may may become public we were focusing our attention on such thing as intellectual property during the previous panel the panelists were mentioning about the procurement of the newly designed technologies that those processes were expedited during the full-scale war and they are about to be expedited even better more design bureaus more design teams will be emerging in the private and government control sector ukraborn prom will play their role in that but before the full-scale invasion those data were not systematized, digitalized and processed properly. So the state program, state anti-corruption program, there is not only the system of anti-corruption measures, it has a function of reformation too. So it contemplates the creation of the information platform of the information base of the construction works where the government, specifically the Ministry of economy which is responsible for this sector where they can categorize all the data which is scattered around the private companies and state controlled factories but again this step step envisages the training of new teams the development of the system that can be tested but commissioned only after the end of the battle operations one of the examples of the risk, which is a derivative risk, is the fact that such a thing as inventory, the collection of information about those construction works, design works, the digitalization, it requires the synergy of a number of ministries because on top of Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Economy, there's also Ministry of Internal Affairs and Ministry of Education in, involved along with other bodies so they should do that inventory and they should have the standardized forms to make sure that this set of data can be used in the joint di digital database so this step as Svetlana mentioned in the anti-corruption program we have the organization measures that can be implemented during the martial law but the information that will be accumulated during this inventory it should be protected so the government authorities responsible for cyber security should be involved in this process and the data that will fill the database it may only be disclosed after the termination of the martial law well by this qr code on the screen you may download the analytic brief of NACO with all 35 key steps of anti-corruption program it doesn't mean that they are either either better or worse but it means that those things are the root of the reforms that brings us closer to the NATO standards thank you thank you very much do we have any questions on the floor if we don't 
I will ask my questions and then we will proceed to another panel. Mr. Reznikov said that the main challenge is the balance between the publicity, transparency and security because the data about the procurement of uniforms or the meals may indirectly give a tip about the n number of servicemen in the Ukrainian troops. So where is this sense of balance? Well, what is the internal sensor? You know, not to give more honey than necessary to Kutya, so to say. Well, you know, here you don't only have to rely upon your internal sensor and your integrity to to make sure this balance between secrecy security and transparency exists we have to engage the civil society the experts those who can exercise the democratic independent monitoring of defense and security sector obviously we have to check for the new forms of such control, new forms of cooperation, as it was mentioned to disclose the plans of government procurement or to make public access to this or that type of information, that should be a balanced decision. But again, this example of anti-corruption council at the Ministry of Defense, I can tell you for sure because the head of our organization is a part of this council so the example of such civil advisory body says that we may find the mechanisms of cooperation that will be efficient and they will provide for such balance between transparency and secrecy and security and reducing corruption during the martial law. You have something to add? Well, I can give you a small example based on the anti-corruption program. During previous panel, this problem was pronounced that the parliament allowed the anti-corruption to postpone the anti-corruption program in the defense sector until the end of martial law. But the cabinet of ministers didn't want to do it because they key subjects were not against they were supporting this idea that those steps should should be taken and it's an answer to your question it would be logical to wait until the termination of the martial law but on the flip side this program brings us closer to the requirements to the fulfillment of requirements of our partners it builds the trust between ukraine and international partners and it's about to provide for not only implementation of the steps in anti-corruption area but also implementation of reforms in such areas as corporate reform of Oberon Prom, government procurement and so on and so forth. We want to thank Glip, we want to thank Svetlana, please take your seats in the studio. I'm asking our technical team to put another chair and I want to invite another trinity of our speakers. Sergei Stepanyan, acting director of the Department for Prevention and Detection of Corruption of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. Dmitry Kalmykov, head of the Anti-Corruption Policy Department of the NACP. And Marina Barinina, head of the Department for Integrity Policy Formation in the Security and Defense Sector of the NACP. So, let's start with Mr. Sergei who is about to tell us what are the steps taken taken by the Ministry of Defense now for the purposes of fulfillment of state anti-corruption program. Please take the microphone. Good afternoon. My greetings to everybody at this event. I want to mention that the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, as it was mentioned by the minister, in time that we are not obliged to fulfill the national anti-corruption program but our vision is such that we are obliged we will fulfill it and the minister himself is trying to do everything to make sure it's fulfilled 
to the maximum extent. Everybody in the Ministry of Defense understands that it's our pathway to victory. And I want to say that during the last data summit, we got two tasks, the victory over Russian Federation and the victory over corruption. The propellant, the propellant of this victory over Russian Federation is the Armed Forces of Ukraine, Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, and those who move, the, who propel the things with overcoming corruption is NACP. So in cooperation, we will over, overtake Russian Federation. It's not so complicated. And then we will overcome corruption, which is a little bit more complicated. But we will deal with both tasks, which are our homework given to us by Mr. Stoltenberg and other officials of NATO. So to fulfill the second task, fighting corruption, we've started working with it way before the summit. It's terrible that I'm saying that we started working beforehand. So we keep working with it all the time. So to fulfill the first task, how do we fulfill the anti-corruption policy of the government in the Ministry of Defense? There was a plan there were persons responsible appointed and we were, we're just following this plan now and we have to say we have good aides there we should not call them aides but rather the friends and ACP they developed a beautiful thing called well they will tell you about it a little bit later is the digital accountability system accountability and reporting system. Do I understand it right that we will be able to witness that report in life what's going on with the fulfillment of the state anti-corruption program so, and what are the problems with this fulfillment. So basically it's a normal working path for the fulfillment of the state program. I understand not everybody is in touch with this program, I will explain you in a general term, so it's more interesting. There are certain pro problems, for example, there are problems discussed by everybody, the development of the system, the GPS navigation. So what is the problem here? Why is it being discussed by the Ministry of Defense? The previous speakers, the previous panelists from NACO, they mentioned it, so you can develop the legislative balance, develop the system, test it, and then not commission it. But we have many remarks to this thing. Our IT specialists say that it makes no sense to develop an IT product that will not be commissioned immediately. The lifetime of an IT product is three years. If we develop it now and we don't use it, we bury the money, basically. And we are not going to use the GPS navigators now. It's 100%. Even if everybody wants it, we're not going to install the GPS trackers on our fuel trucks moving around the country. But again, talking about the preparation of legislation, it's a whole different thing. It should be done. I completely agree with that. And the whole thing, the whole implementation of the state anti-corruption policy is expressed in details. The minister was mentioning it, both us and NACP. We all want to do it. But there are certain moments, certain details that prevents are advances in those directions. For example, there were terms set in that program for development of such steps by the Ministry of Defense. For example, the steps should have been ful fulfilled in March 2023, and this is exactly when the program was adopted. So it's a lengthy process. Everybody understands that it's physically impossible. Some time is required to develop the regulations this is what we're going to fulfill with NACP. We've submitted a letter to amend those terms in the state anti-corruption program. So how those changes will be taking place? We will have a working team 
we will discuss the things and this is how we will achieve the victory over Russian Federation and over corruption. I see no substantial problems there. The Ministry of Defense will fulfill the tasks vested in, in it, on, save for those steps that are impossible to fulfill during the martial law. Also, I was listening to the panelists. I have certain remarks. It may not be very much related to anti-corruption program, but the head of NACP said that he signed the reasonable opinion regarding the Odessa head of the conscription office. You know, is the news of the day that his way of life did not correspond his income, declared income. So I'll tell you the news of the day so that nobody thinks that it goes beyond the Ministry of Defense. We actually initiated, the Ministry of Defense initiated this inspection of the way of life of this head of the conscription office. It was initiated by the Ministry of Defense, but I have to say that there are no things in our country that work like this. The things don't work like this. Yeah, the people want them to work like this. Yeah, but so the Ministry of Defense identified the problem. They initiated the inspection. We submitted letters to NACP. There was a criminal case initiated. It was uh, initiated by the State Investigation Bureau. The state bodies started working. Some results were seen and the case is moving. But, you know, there are no quick solutions. So the quick solution is let's kill all the corruptioners. No, it doesn't work like that. Everything works in the state in a systemic manner. We have to build a system and then it starts working in the same way as the head of NACP said, like one institution has seen it, they submitted letters to another institution, another institution made some inspections, they've produced a reasonable opinion, this reasonable opinion will be forwarded to another institution and this is how the government machine works, it doesn't work any other way because it wouldn't be a state machine otherwise. Another thing I wanted to add, I was listening to the speakers, the head of NACP said that NACP prepared the amendments to the laws of, to prevent the illegal crossing of the border, which were not supported by the government. I was uh, attending the parliamentary committee that was headed by the Minister of Defense, and the Minister of Defense supported all the proposals by the NACP. And there is a practice in the Ministry of Defense. We are responsible for defense and security. We are responsible for the victory over the Russian Federation. And NACP is responsible for destruction of corruption and elimination of corruption. And we support all their proposals and the Ministry of De Declarations. The Ministry of Defense, we were submitting a number of letters to NACP and to the Parliament there are processes underway if somebody does not understand why are we against declaration of income of the servicemen generally we are pro declaration we think that the government officials should declare their income our minister of defense who is not obliged by the legislation is one of the people who submits the tax declarations voluntarily he's not obliged to do so but he still does it voluntarily so that everybody understands he serves as the example to everybody but we cannot force the government officials to submit the declarations because it will result in chaos if anybody has seen the draft law 1871 which was developed not by the Ministry of Justice, but a different. It's in the Parliament since autumn last year. The persons, the servicemen who were not able to submit the declaration in a timely manner are not about to be brought to liability. Okay, a major was running around near Bakhmut with a machine gun. He didn't make it submitting the declaration in a timely manner and we worded in the legislation that he is guilty 
of he should be brought to liability for not submitting the declaration. So there should be no any language regarding the de liability of a serviceman. They, those people, they defend our country, they fulfill their duty, and their bet is their life. They have not submitted the declaration, but yes, they can die there in the front line. It's a very sensitive issue for the armed forces, for the Ministry of Defense, and I'm asking to support us. There is the problem with such category of people, the, the problem with their ability to submit declarations, with the, the problem with their own security and security of their families. This is what I wanted to say, and I'm ready to answer any other questions. But meanwhile, I want to give the floor to Yes, let's proceed to the architects of the state anti-corruption program. Dmitry Kablikov, Kalmykov, head of the anti-corruption policy department of the NACP. I was responsible for development of this program in the government, and I'm responsible for its further coordination and monitoring. The first thing I want to say in the context of the Ministry of Defense is the Wars of Appreciation is the ministry that was seriously involved in development of the program. I w want to thank Mr. Alexey Reznikov personally, who was a person who personally was a propellant of this program, because this program should be considered by the parliamentary committee headed by Mr. Reznikov, and his input is his personal success, it's our joint success, and it was my pleasure to hear about the approach by Mr. Minister when he, in his position, all the words starting with impossible or we cannot, he turns them into possible and yes we can. And it's not only about the weapons supplied to our defense and security forces, but it's also about the anti-corruption measures. We've been hearing for a number of years that the creation of the procurement agency is impossible. And now somehow Mr. Alexei says that this institution, this agency, is established that is about to fulfill the functions that to decrease anti-corruption risks, which is a great pleasure to hear. And the Minister of Defense, in our opinion, demonstrates an exemplary behavior in part of the study and processing of the anti-corruption program. The Ministry has a plan for implementation approved. So there is a political will and acceptance on the top level, so we expect significant progress in fulfillment of all those provisions, but again, we take into account all the proposals expressed by Mr. Sergei, Mr. Alexei, but the anti-corruption strategy was developed before the Russian invasion. It did not take into account certain martial law nuances, like those GPS navigators that were mentioned today for on the fuel trucks. Well, I think that to everybody who attends this press conference today will know about the GPS trackers. Yes, so national agency is open to proposals. We got your letter yesterday and we also initiate the creation of the working team where we propose to discuss those proposals and develop a joint plan of actions that will be implemented the soonest possible and it will be efficient to the maximum extent. So thank you for the constructive position, but I want to talk about my thing. We were talking today a lot about the defense and security sector, about 75 steps to be taken in this sector, but looking at it broadly, the anti-corruption strategy and state anti-corruption program, they require from 109 bodies and other government authorities and agencies to solve 72 key problems for prevention of corruption in 15 priority areas. So to solve those 72 
key problems the anti-corruption strategy contemplates achievement of the 272 in intermediate results and to achieve them all those bodies and agencies have to implement 1187 steps within two and a half years it's a tremendous amount of work tremendous amount of communication about the condition of fulfillment so it's a key challenge for us as a body which will further on coordinate and monitor toward the evaluation of the fulfillment of the program by proper collection of information its visualization in the system that may serve as a propellant for the program for both society and the state so we've learned all the key strategic documents existing in the leading countries of the world specifically the instruments of monitoring and evaluation of the indicators we've learned the best information products th that are able to visualize the condition of fulfillment of different documents and we've prepared the concept based on which we started developing the information monitoring system within the year starting from September last year to May this year we were working actively in this area we have developed the system and the system is made of two key parts one is an internal part or closed part which is can only be accessed by the entities that fulfill the program and another part is open part a public part so the internal part is already commissioned and now the bodies and agencies start submitting information to the system this information will be processed and generalized until the 16th of august and on 17th of august the public component will be commissioned and the public the civil society will be able to see the dynamics of fulfillment of all the steps of anti-corruption program then in future the system for monitoring and coordination contemplates 11 quarterly monitorings upon each reporting period then three annual evaluations in the first quarter of year 24 25 26 and then the final evaluation of efficiency of implementation the program it will be a summary document that will summarize this success of the program implementation that will be laid as fundamental for the further development of the state anti-corruption program so what were the key tasks during the development of this program we wanted to create the tool that will be of help to the entities which fulfill those steps which will be able to distribute those measures taken within every institution we wanted to create the uh, steps for internal control and the platform for coordination of the entities responsible for fulfillment then we wanted to create a tool for verification of data by the employees of the national anti-corruption agency for corruption prevention it should be the only source where all the information is accumulated about all the documents which uh, confirm the fulfillment of this program and it will automate all the processes related to automatic calculation of data now you're seeing on the screen how one of the tasks is being fulfilled planning and organization of steps in every institution so there may be four users in every institution it the, well the first role can be fulfilled by the minister or the head of the ministry then authorized managers the, those are the state secretaries or deputy ministers and third key role is the implementator so those are the heads of the structural units the heads of the departments which fulfill those steps within the ministry or organize the fulfillment of that step and there is a fourth role the coordinator is a 
person who will be responsible for training organization arrangement as a liaison between the institution and NACP. So this system allows the head to distribute all the responsibilities and the deputies will distribute those responsibilities among their subordinates. Then the system contemplates a number of processes. Here on the screen you see a simplified version of how it's going on. At the first stage there is a coordination between the implementator and deputy ministers. So the implementator during quarterly monitor and reports to the deputy minister about the condition of fulfillment of the step and the deputy minister verifies the information and confirms the correctness of data and then this information is being submitted further on or otherwise if they don't agree they return this information to the implementator with the relevant comments what should be added thus on this stage there is internal institutional control on the level of deputy minister the control of efficiency of fulfillment of every step another step is the information coming to the representative of NACP they get familiarized with that information and they will confirm the fact that this information is is true and, and sufficient in some exceptional cases should it be insufficient there will be a need to add some documents and the representative of NACP may require to provide some additional information and then the results of the monitoring will be made public. You see on the right there is a line. The line, this is the coordination between the closed and public components. So they confirm it with the signature of the employee of the NACP and the information is made public so that, and a public may see that the step is either fulfilled, fulfilled all part or incomplete. We, I understand we're limited of time, so this is what the account of, uh, of different users look like. For example, the, the ministers, they see only the steps that were vested in the ministry, which are the tasks of the ministry. The key role is with the minister, and here they can see their deputies, and on, on the popping up list they can see the ministers who are responsible of this or that function. So this is what the working page of the manager, of the responsible manager looks like. This is what the account of the implementator looks like. They have their steps to be taken and they report on their fulfillment. There is a coordinator role too. It's, the, it's a person that sees all the steps to be taken by the ministry and they keep track of their fulfillment in the timely manner they can coordinate it with the minister to comply with the procedure and the last page is the account of the analyst of NACP there are 15 such persons appointed they are authorized to collect accumulate and process all that information and to put it into a public part what were the key tasks in development of the public component. First of all, it should be a source of holistic and objective information about the condition of steps taken. It should have interactive visualization and convenient interface. Then there, there is a number of filtration. The software is humongous. There is a number of sectors and the users will be interested in some institutions or sectors or spheres or areas so the filter allows you to proceed to that part of the program that is of the interest of the user then the system contemplates a number of depth levels for example those who want to get more comprehensive information they can go to a deeper level to get to the information cards where they can get a holistic information about the condition and the documents confirming the condition of fulfillment of those steps so it's for both both for those who want to get a general 
impression and for those who are looking for detailed information for us is the reflection of the monitoring and evaluation i want to remind you the monitoring is quarterly and the evaluation is annual another tool that we think is correct is very right is the coordination between closed and public component in the public part there will be some functionality contemplated through which any person can submit information to the closed system for example any event that is seen as fulfilled that it's fulfilled in in com not to the full extent such notices will be seen by all the executioners and they will become respectively a reason to consider that report and if this information is verified it can become a reason to update the status on the system in my opinion it's a important feedback tool an important tool for our colleagues from the civil sector for the feedback from our colleagues is the tool for objectivization of this information because we may commit error as well and our task is to make sure that this information is faithful it reflects what's going on in reality so this is very in brief given our restrictions on time so this is what the pages are about to look like the basic page that discloses the characteristics of the program the uh, condition of its fulfillment the key persons responsible and key agencies responsible on the other page you can see the results of the monitoring and evaluation you see is broken down by units or areas and if we get a little bit deeper for example the const in some areas like construction or land relations in terms of strategic expectations if we click on the program is the slide a problem is the slide on the right we see a number of expectations a number of steps to be taken and in the context of every result we see there is the card system and the colors of those cards they reflect the condition of the status of the step was it complete was it incomplete was so you can see the overall success of the fulfillment and clicking on every card you can see all the information and understand why the condition is such thank you very much and let's proceed to miss marina so let's put another presentation thank you good afternoon dear colleagues I don't have to convince anybody that corruption is horrific and the most horrific results of the corruption during the war is the loss of lives, loss of health, the loss of lives of our defenders, of the civilians, that the horrific consequence of corruption is the loss of money which results in loss of capability of our armed forces, loss of territories and the loss of reputation including the loss of reputation on international level which reflects in the support and our victory i mean the status of our support and our victory so based on those things the national and agency for corruption prevention is building the integrity and culture culture and policy and integrity it may not be may not be a notion known to everybody but it's way broader than anti-corruption steps because the integrity includes such components as ethical values professionalism gender policy leadership and so on and so forth which are not directly which don't seem to be directly related to corruption but in fact they are related because only after we build the resilient sustainable systems which are capable to resist some level of stress and they can continue 
to function and given all of this there was a new department established in the NACP the Department for Integrity Policy Formation in the Security and Defense Sector well where should I click so what was the department created for it was created as an analog of the Center of Advanced Experience or as our foreign colleagues say Center of Excellence this is where we have to accumulate everything best that is in the world the best practices the best standards and we have to implement those that are not yet implemented in ukraine many things are already implemented i know it for sure this center should fulfill the function of the coordinator between ukraine and nato in process of building of integrity this initiative of building of integrity it was implemented in ukraine way long ago and it was my pleasure to be a part of this process also an important role of the center is that it's about to become a center for the support of the defense and security bodies in implementation of state anti-corruption program on top of that we wanted to be a joint window for all the defense and security bodies which cooperate with the national agencies not to make it th through a number of doors in unbalanced with unbalanced opinions or different opinions of the same things it's necessary to mention that this approach to the integrity building it was proposed by the expert opinion upon the results of the evaluation made by the international experts in year 2011 they've written directly what they recommend to the ukrainian part to pay attention to education of the culture to make the achievements irrevocable to reinforce the attempts of cooperation between the government agencies and the agency for corruption prevention for monitoring of the progress and those are the tasks of the department to analyze the corruption risks on a strategic level and to provide advice only in coordination with the agencies of the security and defense sector themselves in cooperation with the civil society with international experts we have to add value to this building we have to monitor the progress and to cherish the offsprings of this integrity and the last thing that i want to say that one of the important tasks is, in our opinion is the building of the proactive team the team building of proactive team of experts where we want to have not only the representatives of defense and security sector involved but also representatives of the civil society civil organizations international experts and just experts who are not in any labor relations with any organization i understand that my presentation should be the shortest because talking about the achievements is a little bit premature it's been only one week upon my appointment on this in this office but i can only talk about the ambitious goals that we set for ourselves so talking about the anti-corruption strategy and implementation of the state anti-corruption program we were talking to our colleagues with serhi stepanian and other colleagues really we understand that there are challenges there are risks that are related to implementation of the measures and steps during the war and it's not only about the cyber security information security that we were talking about today we were listening to the NACO presentation there are more risks to that and understanding the importance of all those steps and measures we want to create a working team we should be made of the implementators of this or those steps i got myself familiarized with the program approved by the minister 
of defense Alexei Reznikov. It includes all the steps and measures contemplated by NACO, but calculated the number of the persons responsible for fulfillment, we will come to a number of about 40 persons. So one team will include 40 plus persons, but if we say that it's not a person but an entity responsible, it may include two or three or even more representatives. So yes, we realize that n not everything is perfect. There are no perfect conditions for implementation of the strategy, but at the same time we have political will, we have resources, we have ambitions, we have desire. That's why... Wait, I apologize. I apologize. So our following steps are very simple. To create a sectoral working team, it will be created shortly. To discuss the difficulties and problems with the direct persons directly responsible, so they address the relevant agencies who can provide relevant support. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we have any questions on the floor, let me know by raising your hand. Now that we don't have questions on the floor, I have questions to them. Do you have anything to it? I have a provo I have a promo provoking question. Yeah, me too. So, dear colleagues, look. For example, there is there is such a thing. There is such a step. There is such a step in the program of the ministry. The termination of efficiency of certain regulations. So the ministry has prepared a draft law. They submitted it to the parliament, and as it happens sometimes to some draft laws, how would NACP react to this? Where when the those draft laws they die in the parliament, will will it be shown in the system as complete or incomplete or partly complete? Yeah, I know it's a question of provoking nature, but I would like to hear your opinion. Well, first of all, we can consider the formulation of this matter. I know that it's a personal ambition of the head of NACP, I mean, the termination of effectiveness of the dwelling code, but we were talking about the reformation of the law, amendment of the law for provision of the s servicemen with the free residence. There is no such procedure for the time being, but on the other hand, given the exceptional nature of the people who are entitled to such dwelling, it's, this procedure is accompanied by certain risks, so I would rather pay attention to this angle. Well, what I want to add, first I want to give a couple of comments regarding the system. I want to mention for all the spectators, we were making this program, how Ukraine is about to become the efficient state, not for NACP, not for the Ministry of Defense. We were doing it for the citizens and the businesses. So if anybody is asking why there is a corruption in this or that area, all the areas covered by this program, they can be tracked in this system. So please get involved. Please get involved in the implementation of all those measures. The day before yesterday, there was a meeting with the Vice Prime Minister for European Integration, Ms. Stefanishina, and she's asking, so is it going to sh be shown in red in, on your system that, has, that are incomplete? The, the, those are the requirements of the European Union. So yes, those steps will be marked red and you will be able to see how much is red in this or that area and what creates obstacles for every citizen to live in a powerful wealthy Ukraine and who should do what to make a country like that as to the residences code is a problem for every serviceman because in compliance with the Soviet era code the the service dwellings are being 
presented they're being provided to the military the military are the biggest category but in, and it creates corruption well in many organizations to get a free dwelling you have to bribe the commission or other people that are responsible for distribution of such dwellings so based based on such things we have to update the housing code to reduce to eliminate any corruption risks because there are dozens of uh, dozens of crimes committed that are not detected by the law enforcement so only if we change the free housing with the say 20 or 30 loan programs blending programs we, those are the programs implemented in other countries and this is how we can overcome the corruption in the housing code they only remove the preamble about the communist the key role of communist party in the process only recently so let's thank them at least for that so you've just presented the new agency as the classics of the american diplomacy said that the good word with the cold is way better than just a good word so what will be your call because good intentions are fine but what will be your propellant your whip in this process you know we are basing on the principle that everything that is done in the forced manner is not always efficient so on one hand in the context of a whip we want to create all possible conditions financial conditions methodic conditions organizational conditions we should create platforms for coordination we were talking about the sectoral monitoring group it's a potential aid by our international partners the budget program for implementation of state program state anti-corruption program we hope that it will be replenished with funds that we would be able to distribute among the participants of the program specifically for the fund consuming steps the development of the software the analytic and educational campaign so for us the whip is to create the conditions all the conditions and to create a desire in the institution and mr Alexei is an example of such approach in this program if there is a political will if there is an understanding of necessity of such measures to be taken this is how we will see some results this is our main tool but at the same time this site will be very convenient very user-friendly in context of every area every ministry every agency it will have an english language version in september i hope state anti-corruption program is one of the barometers of the censors of ukrainian movement to towards the european union and this is something that will be an indicator for our european partners in terms of our perspective our plans it will allow our partners to have an objective understanding of what's going on who fulfills their tasks to what extent with what efficiency and nacp has about a quarter of all those steps to be taken by them so this is the whip this is the propellant to our European Euro Atlantic our expect to fulfillment of our European and Euro Atlantic expectations those are there are some formal things we have to inform Prime Minister and President and the Committee on anti-corruption policy on a quarterly basis we have to indicate all the steps that were not fulfilled or were fulfilled in part we have to create a working team that is about to start the operation in testing mode and during this year's evaluation we will have all the ministers the president and i hope the prime minister who will be able to hear 
about the reports about all the measures and steps that were fulfilled and those that were incomplete we will see maybe new proposals about the steps that were not taken in full and we have this complex approach to this problem and we're not positioning ourselves as a, as an agency who thinks that they are entitled to demand something from other agencies or bodies or ministries we don't have any tools of enforcement so how to do it so that we don't have it looking as a, as a group of interested people but rather as a government body so I would like to add a couple of words to what my colleague has just said there are different different tools different methods or techniques of influence and encouragement you know somebody may need a good word and the cold and for somebody the best motivation is to be cool to be a part of the team to be among the winners we know about it we know how the behavior of an individual changes when they are part of the team or when they act individually in the team they recognize when it's recognized in the team that it's cool to be a winner they will be acting as a winner so it's not about the whip and the gingerbread we need to create the environment where it's fashionable it's cool to be a winner it's cool to to be ahead of everybody it's cool to be a leader it's cool it's cool to set the tone and it's not fashionable not to fulfill anti-corruption steps to be involved in some machinations or schemes and to answer inconvenient questions why haven't you submitted the declaration that's the first question and the second question is uh, well you know the group of interested people is when we deal with something that is not in compliance with your internal values those people can exist and obviously such people can end up in that circle but with time they become visible and they fall off by themselves i cannot i cannot forecast what is the number of people to be on the team of the integrity of the integrity leaders but again i have in more than 10 years of experience of work in the ministry of defense in and i was able to create such teams of winners and it's my pride that some of the members of those teams continue serving today continue working on the management positions in that ministry or in other agencies so again we can continue documenting the same my violations all the time we can continue stepping on the same rake but we can make sure that those rakes are not on your way or there are indicators that if you step on that rake be prepared to get a bruise on your forehead well if we don't have questions on the floor in fact let's wrap up may, may may add a couple of words as the summary just a couple of things i want to add just in continuation of what you've just said in reality there are no preconditions not to fight the corruption is there a reason not to kill russians in the war well if you want to live go kill them if you don't so don't kill them if you don't fight corruption you die as a country you die as the society you're not going to exist well it will be a lengthy process you're not dying right away but you're dying for sure so what are the reasons to fight corruption well if you want to live then fight it if you don't want then you're not going to live normally but it's not that everybody understands it some corruptioners they don't understand it you know they think that their death it's a, it's a long process and they don't notice it but what what we used to have until the year 2013 our country was dying it was dying slowly gradually but it was dying and shouldn't be shouldn't it be for those processes 
that were initiated by the civil society. You we will remember the corruption of Yanukovych times. It was all aimed at the death of the country. If you don't want to die, so fight corruption. If you don't want Ukraine to exist, let's develop corruption in Ukraine and it will cease existing. So it's an axiom. It's my response. So just like during the war, you want to live, kill the enemy. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure to, to see all of you. Mr. Serki brought us to some philosophic reflections in the end of our conversation. Well, I want to thank all of our speakers. I'm reminded you joining us was Serhi Stepanyan, acting director of the Department for Prevention and Detection of Corruption and Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, Mitro Kalmykov, head of the Anti-Corruption Policy Department of the NACP, and Marina Borinina, head of the Department for Integrity Policy Formation in the Security and Defense Sector of NACP. My name is...